It's not complicated. It's not scary. And you can do it. So you want to build a Watts link. You've probably seen other videos on it. If not, you should. It's good to see a variety of designs and opinions. Just don't get discouraged by them. You'll see what I mean. Watts links are extremely complicated. If you don't do it exactly right, it's not going to work properly and you will die. Also, you need some computer aided design software, a CNC plasma table and the skills to use them. I'm Man Candy with Man Candy's Creations and today I want to show you it's not complicated. It's not scary and you can do it. A Watts link has three main components. Two link bars, each mounted to opposite sides of the vehicle frame. The other ends of those link bars connect to a third link that's mounted vertically to the center of a solid axle. I refer to that third link as a propeller. It's not a propeller. It just looks like one. Also, it's more fun to say. And if I'm not having fun, what am I even doing here? So what's it for? See what I did? To keep our vehicle chassis from moving independently from our rear axle, we need to secure the axle to the frame in a way that still allows up and down movement. A pan hard bar, which you're likely familiar with, does exactly that. And it works great on vehicles with static height suspension. But on vehicles with a lot more suspension travel, like air springs or hydraulics, the pan hard bar actually pushes the chassis to the side as the bar follows an arc. The Watts link has two bars that follow opposite arcs, but the rotating propeller absorbs those arcs, causing the center point, which is attached to the axle, to move in a more vertical motion. But how does this floppy contraption actually keep the axle stable? I think the easiest way to understand what's happening is to convert the familiar panhard bar to a Watts link step by step and observe the changes. With the panhard bar removed, notice how the distance between this point on the axle and this point on the chassis changes. Installing a bar between those two points prevents this change. Even if we shorten the panhard bar and mount it to the center of the axle, we see the same result. But if we disconnect the panhard bar from the axle and instead connect it to a propeller, the sideways motion comes back. This is because when the chassis pushes the bar left, rather than pushing the axle with it, the propeller just rotates clockwise. Useless. If we add another link to the other end of the propeller, we can see that the rotation of the propeller causes the bars to move in opposite directions. When the right bar moves to the right, the propeller pushes the left bar left. And when the right bar moves left, the left bar right. Wow, that is fascinating, but still useless. Notice how the left bar is moving in the opposite direction of the chassis. So let's prevent that movement by connecting the two and bam! Suddenly this floppy contraption is keeping the axle firmly in place while still allowing up and down movement. All the forces in the bars and the propeller remain the same. We just can't see them anymore because each component is preventing the opposite motion of its fellow components. Neat. A Watts link will likely work just fine if you follow a few simple rules. A Watts link performs best when the propeller is centered, both link bars are equal length, and they are level with the ground. So on a vehicle with non-adjustable height suspension, i.e. metal springs, the Watts link bars will be level with the ground no matter what that ride height is. For example, your buddy's truck has a static ride height of three inches off the ground. Both link bars should be level with the ground. Your Mustang suspension rests at six inches. Both link bars should be level with the ground. An adjustable height vehicle is just a little more complicated. If the ride height can change, when should the bars be level? It's often said that the link bars should be level at half travel. In other words, if your vehicle suspension has a range of zero to 12 inches, the bar should be level at six inches. I'm gonna sprinkle some personal opinion on this one. Remember what I said earlier, a Watts link performs best when both link bars are level with the ground. So what if you have 12 inches of lift, but you plan to cruise around 99% of the time at three inches? Wouldn't it make more sense to have the Watts link in its optimal operating position at three inches? I think so. 
It would make even more sense if you plan to race that vehicle. It's important to understand though that not following the half travel rule may push the watts link to the extreme when fully lifting or fully lowering the vehicle. We'll talk more about that later. If that concerns you, stick to setting up your watts link with the bars level at half travel. If you're not racing, this will be just fine. I'm going to set up this watts link properly paying attention to geometry that a lot of people ignore, but if it gets confusing, don't stress out about it. Stick around to the end and we'll discuss which stuff is really important and which stuff is just me trying to please the couch fabricators out there. What about the angle of the dangle, idiot? Enough talking, let's build a Watts link. In the last episode, we built a heavy duty diff cover that would hold the bushing for the propeller. There are other ways of mounting the bushing, which is another good reason to check out a few videos. There's not really a right or wrong way as long as it's strong and it's centered on the axle. Once that's done, the rest of the Watts link will be designed at full scale on, you guessed it, cardstock. Before you can do that though, you need to grab a few measurements from your vehicle with the suspension set to your desired ride height. These measurements are, one, the height of the center of the Watts link propeller from the ground. Two, the height of the frame rails from the ground. Three, the space between the frame rails. Four, the dimensions of the frame rails. And five, and this one's optional, the size of your differential vertically. This measurement will be important on my build, but may not be important to you. If you're Mr. Cool Guy, you can do this next part in a CAD program, but for the rest of us, we're going to go to the kitchen table where we have some cardstock set up and we're going to map out the entire Watts link system as it will appear at ride height while eating snacks. I have two pieces of cardstock laid out on the table the same width as my frame. I'm going to find the center point and using the bottom of the cardstock as the ground, measure up and mark the center of the propeller. Now I'm going to mark the height of the frame rails. I measured from the ground to the bottom of the frame rail. Next, we're going to use the measurement of the space between the frame rails to mark the inside walls of the frame. I divided this measurement by two and I'm going to measure from the center line out on both sides. Now we can draw on the frame rails because we know the frame rail dimensions. Now I'm going to decide how big the propeller will be. The size isn't really important, but I'd recommend somewhere between six and 12 inches. If your vehicle has a fixed ride height, six inches is probably big enough. But if your vehicle is adjustable or has a lot of travel, I definitely recommend a larger propeller. Again, we'll talk about why once this one is built and working. My differential is nine and a half inches tall. So to keep it from hanging down and potentially snagging on road debris, I wanna make it a bit smaller than the differential. So. Let's go with nine inches. This is the size of the propeller and not where the holes for the heim joints will be. The bolt holes will be a little closer to the center. I'm just gonna cheat and use one of the heim joints to determine where the holes will be. Notice that I'm marking the propeller hole locations on the center line, which implies that the propeller is straight up and down. The propeller in a properly designed Watts link will not be perfectly vertical at ride height it will actually be angled slightly so that the Watts link forms a Z shape. We'll find out how much and why in just a bit. But first, we need to determine the approximate length of our link bars. Starting from our top bolt and the propeller, draw a level line towards a frame rail. It doesn't matter which way. Your Watts link can look like a Z or a backwards Z. It doesn't matter. Both will work exactly the same. But remember, level bars is key. Next, from the bottom propeller bolt, draw another level line towards the opposite frame rail. The top bar runs directly into the right frame rail. So using heim joint, I'm gonna position it a half inch away from the frame to prevent rubbing and mark the center of the bolt hole. The left bar ends way below the frame. That's okay. You can do this two ways. You can either extend an imaginary line from the frame rail as I did and then position the heim the same distance away from that line as we did on the other side. When doing that, I mismeasured and almost screwed things up. Luckily, I set the heim joint down to check and realized my mistake. That would have sucked. It would have been smarter and easier to just measure from the center line out 
the distance of the other link bar. Because remember, both link bars should be the same length. So now that we have the Heim joint bolt holes marked out here in the middle of nowhere, we need to connect those holes to the frame by drawing some tabs. I just used the head of the Heim joint to determine how big to make the end and connected that to the frame. This is an unusually long tab, so I like to try to make it a bit wider to make it a bit stronger. We're going to add some stuff to the sides of this tab later to toughen it up a bit, but for right now, we're just doing two-dimensional stuff. All right, now here's where things get a little complicated. In order to determine the proper position of the propeller, we need to determine how much our link bars will push and pull as the suspension travels. If you don't know what I'm talking about, stop for a moment and go watch my video, Suspension Basics, Episode 1, right here. Our cardstock mock-up so far says our link bars will be a touch under 17 inches long. So let's see what the arc will look like with a 17 inch bar. Take your total suspension travel, set the ruler down and line up the six inch mark with the level line. Line up the end of the ruler on one end of the arc and the 12 inch mark of the ruler on the other end of the arc and then draw a line. Now you can measure the total push pull of your 17 inch link bars. It's almost exactly one inch. This means the link bars are going to push and pull the propeller back and forth as the suspension travels one inch. That said, if we want to set this thing up right, we need to take that into consideration. If the total movement is one inch, let's set this thing up so that the link bars push the propeller past the center a half inch on one extreme and pull it back over the center a half inch for a grand total of one inch. That means though that when the bars are level, they are no longer 17 inches. They're actually 17 and a half inches. For the mathematicians out there, yes, adding a half inch to the link bar length will change that arc slightly. In turn, changing the push pull amount a little more too. So a half inch isn't dead nuts accurate, but if you took this extra step, you're already way ahead of those that told you the propeller should be straight up and down. Mark your new propeller bolt holes and connect them with a line. Now you can see where the Z shape comes from. The confusing stuff is done and it's time to turn this mess into templates, the same way we did with the left side tabs. If you're a die-hard garage fabber, you know exactly what's going on here. But if you're new to the channel, our cardstock templates are actual size. But in order to create wooden templates for the plasma cutter, we need to shrink them 3 16 of an inch to account for the width of the plasma cutter tip. If that's not clear now, it'll make all the sense when we actually start cutting. With the pieces cut out, the last job for the cardstock templates is to help mark the bolt holes.
There are a couple different ways to build the center link. Another reason why it's important, you go watch a couple different videos. There's a style where there's a bridge that attaches one side of the axle to the other. And if you're using a bushing like I am, that bushing would be welded in the middle of that bridge. So in that style, since the outer sleeve is welded to the bridge, it can't move. Instead, the bolt and the center sleeve rotate. If you're building that style on your propeller, you're gonna drill a hole in the center, the size of your bolt. One of the pieces will attach to the front, the other one will attach on the back side. Since mine is attached to the diff cover, I can't attach one to the back side. On this style, the bolt in the inner sleeve will not move. Instead, the outer sleeve will rotate. So on mine, I drilled a two inch hole that fits the bushing because on this style, the propeller is the bushing. It doesn't matter which design you choose, they're all good, as long as the propeller can rotate. The bridge style is a little easier. This way is a little more complex, but the choice is up to you. Just before welding everything together, I want to smooth out the jagged edges of the handheld plasma cuts to make them look like more finished, professionally manufactured pieces. So this is the propeller in its mostly completed form. All I need to do is weld it up, but before I do that, I need to bevel the flat pieces so that I can get better penetration. I don't want to weld on the inside because I don't think I can get the MIG gun all the way towards the center, but also because I think it'll look a lot cleaner if it's just welded on the outside. So that bevel is going to have to go almost all the way through the quarter inch plate in order to get nearly 100% penetration. I tried to cheat and just use a flap disc, but I couldn't get the bevel deep enough and it was difficult to achieve a uniform bevel. So. Then I tried to get smart and chucked a tapered countersink bit into the drill press and massaged the edges to a very uniform angle. It was working, but it was taking way too long. So unfortunately, it's time for the die grinder with a carbide bit. This tool works so well, but I'm constantly trying to avoid using it because it creates millions of evil metal micro splinters. But damn. Look at that bevel. And guess what? I got a splinter. The last thing before welding the propeller together is to move the grease fitting to a position where it can be easily accessed. Let's finish up what's left of the tabs and we should be able to start slapping this thing together. I need to touch on a couple things I neglected to show in the last video when we made the armored differential cover. The first thing is the nut inside the cover will be welded, but I only had nylock nuts available when I was building it. Nylock nuts don't like to be welded, so if you need to weld on a locking nut, ditch the nylock and find yourself some all metal C-lock nuts. Second, I mentioned in the last video that I was creating a cover that would fit over the factory cover. I forgot to show that little tidbit and oh man, I got plenty of comments on that one. Go check them out, but take them seriously. Their concerns are valid. They said that my cover will cause issues with the differential oil. When you replace the factory rounded cover with a chunky one like I built, you're potentially causing a situation where increased fluid turbulence starts to whip and froth the oil. And when the oil is all like whipped cream, it doesn't lubricate so well. Keep this in mind when buying aftermarket covers because a lot of people don't pay attention to this little morsel of information. My answer to this challenge was to not replace the factory cover at all, but just cover the cover. I currently have the propeller in the vertical position. And if I did my math correctly, which would be a miracle, honestly, when 
These tabs are in their proper location, which would be when this bar is level, in other words, zero, it should push the propeller from center a half inch. Let's see what happens. With the bar level, it pushed the propeller over an eighth inch more than I guessed, but I think that's good. I'm gonna run with it, make the other bar, and then see how it works. Here, I'm determining the front to back location of the frame side link bar mounts, and I realized I wasn't explaining while I was doing it. Just like the Watts link bars push and pull, so do the parallel four link bars. So the Watts link propeller will actually be getting pulled back and forth a bit as well. I've determined that total movement to be about a half inch. So I positioned the Watts link bars parallel to the axle and then measured a quarter inch back. This way, when the suspension extends and pulls the axle forward, it actually straightens out the Watts link bars, ensuring that the heim joints on the link bars don't contact the tabs at extreme points of travel. If you're worried about that, you can install high misalignment spacers on your Himes, and you'll probably never be able to rub the tabs, no matter how much travel you have. All right, since everything is good on that side, in theory, everything should be good on this side. Or not. Uh, I'm like over an inch off on this side. And I'm not sure what's happening. Did I cut this pipe an inch short? No, it's spot on. So why am I so far? Oh, oh nice, okay. I just had this bracket at a funky angle, so it actually looks like I'm uh, almost spot on. We got 0.4 degrees. All right, I'm at almost a half a degree off from level, but you know what? I'm lazy. I think I'm gonna roll with it. The Watts link really is not as finicky as some people make it sound. I'm gonna put some heavy tacks on everything so we can cycle it and watch it work before fully welding it up. It's kind of funny. As I was welding, the angle finder decided to change to 0 0.1, almost zero degrees. I'm not complaining. So the Watts link, as it sits at ride height, it's pretty close to perfect. It's a good day. Let's move the suspension up and down and see what it looks like. The Watts link is working perfectly. So what I'm going to do is fully weld on the brackets because I know they're right where I want them to be and there's no reason they'll have to move. The confusing part is over, but the bolt in the propeller is seeing forces it was not designed to see. Bolts are generally designed to hold tensile forces, which is pulling force, and shear forces, which is more of a lateral movement. The pivot bolt in the propeller as it currently sits is seeing forces more like banging gears in a stick shift. I honestly don't know what those forces are called, but I do know that bolt wasn't designed to see that. So on this and every style bushing, the bolt needs to be supported on both ends. So I need to build something that supports the head of the bolt on the outside of the propeller.
I just got a new tooth and it is so smooth. Like ridiculously smooth. I don't think there are words to describe how smooth this tooth is. I think the only way you could comprehend smoothness of this level would be to lick my tooth. But I'd rather you didn't. I feel kind of bad. I think everyone should have the opportunity to feel this level of smoothness. I'm just not that nice. Maybe if it was a front tooth. Maybe. It would be weird. But maybe if it was a front tooth, I would let you lick it. But it's, it's a back tooth, so it's, it's not you, it's me. Yeah, that is smooth, but not as smooth as this tooth. The Watts Link project is coming to an end and I'm super excited with how it turned out. I followed all the rules when building a Watts Link. I wanted to quickly talk about which rules are really important and which ones not so much. One, both bars should be perfectly level at ride height. It is important that both link bars are perfectly level at some point in their travel, preferably somewhere near half travel. But a Watts link, even in an extreme position like this is now, will still work just fine. Both bars being level at some point in their travel will ensure that your axle is moving straight up and down. But on this truck in particular, the truck has 12 inches of travel, but I have the bar set up to be level at four inches. It's very important to know that by doing that, you're potentially pushing the Watts link to the extreme at one of the points of travel. The danger with Watts links and adjustable height vehicles is the potential to overextend the Watts link. If one bar and the propeller straighten out, you have the potential of hyperextending the Watts link, inverting it, causing it to lock up kind of like bending your knee backwards. And I imagine it'll hurt just as much. It's easiest to set up a Watts link with both bars level, so you might as well follow that rule. While on that topic, when your Watts link is done, the link bar mounts on your frame should not be at the same level, meaning one should be higher than the other. If both link bar mounts on the frame are at the same height, that means it's impossible for your link bars to be level with the ground simultaneously. If your frame side link bar mounts are at the same distance off the ground, you've done something wrong. As a rule of thumb, the mounts on the frame should match the propeller. If you have six inches between the bolts, the mounts on the frame on one side should be six inches lower than the other. Both link bars should be exactly the same length. Believe it or not, no. I designed my Watts link to be adjustable so I can move my axle left and right between the bed sides. So if I have to adjust the position of my axle, my link bars will technically be two different lengths. But since the propeller moves freely, it will actually absorb the difference between the two bars. It's important to understand though, that if your bars are not exactly the same length, the arcs will be slightly different and therefore your axle won't be moving perfectly straight up and down. The bigger the difference between the bars, the more noticeable that angled movement of your axle will be. So it's best to try to keep your link bars the same length. The propeller must be centered on the axle. Again, no, it's kind of the same as the link bar length. If your propeller is not centered, your link bars will be two different lengths, which could be okay to an extent. The propeller could technically be mounted several inches off center, and believe it or not, it will still work better than a pan hard bar. The propeller must have a Z-shaped angle at ride height, not necessarily. On an adjustable height vehicle or any vehicle that has a lot of suspension travel, that angle is much more important. If you have a static height vehicle that's built for the street, you'll probably only see two to three inches of suspension travel. So if when your bars are level with the ground, your propeller is straight up and down, don't worry about it. 
it's okay. But with a vehicle with a lot of suspension travel, building the watts link so that the propeller is angled when the bars are level will give you extra movement in the propeller so you don't have to worry about it. As a side note, the bigger the propeller is, the less it will move during suspension travel. So on adjustable height vehicles, with a lot of travel, it is better to have a larger propeller. And if you only have a few inches of travel, you could have a much smaller propeller. The larger the propeller is, it's less likely you'll reach that point that the watts link inverts. But the larger the propeller, the larger the distance between the frame side mounts. So it's kind of a eh, thing. Is that it? I think that's it. I just want to take a moment to thank everyone that has joined this ride. Last month, GarageFab crossed the 10,000 subscriber mark, and only a couple weeks later, we're already approaching 13,000. I had high hopes for this channel, but I honestly didn't expect it to happen this fast. So from me and my family, to those of you that have subscribed, liked, and shared videos, thank you. And until the next one, my friends, keep moving forward.